these dipole signals are wonderful things, ready, ready wired and ready to go. But where do I put them on the layout? Let me explain. From basic pamphlets given away with magazines, to chapters in books, to whole books about signalling, there's an awful lot of stuff out there to tell you how signalling worked. But it's also very confusing. The more information you get, the more complex it appears to be. So let's break it down and have a look at the real, real basics of railway signalling. If you're looking for a treatise on the history of signalling, I would recommend to you Tom Rolt's book Red for Danger. It talks about railway accidents but it it's set within the context that for each accident there are lessons learned and those uh, accidents that he talks about in the very early days where signalling and point operation was very much a hit and miss thing when it went wrong lessons were learnt and the signalling system improved. One name that keeps coming up in Tom Rolt's book is Captain Tyler of the Board of Trade Inspector of Railways. He was an engineer and the inspectorate have drawn their men from the engineers since the year dot. Now the Board of Trade was loath to make legislation and so Captain Tyler's great skill was guiding the railways into what he considered to be a safe place really through the use of three basic tools, lock, block and break. Lock was all about locking points and signals together and locking points so that they couldn't be changed once a train was trying to run over them. Block was all about block instruments separating trains from each other on the track and brake was about having continuous brakes on trains. Now we're not going to worry about the brake element here but we are going to look at locks and blocks and particularly how the block bit relates to how we signal our layouts. And there's a vast array of signals to choose from, from simple semaphore, colour light, ground signals. What do we use and where do we put them? Well let's go right back to basics and let's look at what a block is and that will get us introduced to the sort of signals that we're likely to want. Now for the purpose of this exercise I'm going to talk about semaphore signals. There are two types of semaphore signals. There is a red stop signal and there is a yellow distant signal. The stop signal is very much stop or go. You're not allowed to pass that if it says stop and you are allowed to pass it if it says go. Um, upper quadrant signals go up to mean go, lower quadrant signals mean move down to mean go. Different railways used uppers and lowers. Your era, your area, you decide what signals you're going to use. Now for safety reasons and to allow more than one train to run over a whole miles and miles of track at the same time, the line was divided up into bits and each bit was called a block section. And here is a picture of a block section of double track main line. We're only concerned here with the top line running left to right and three signal boxes conveniently named A, B and C. A block section is the bit between the signal outside signal box A and the signal outside signal box B. And that section between A and B is controlled by B. He gives permission to allow a train to go into it. So essentially if, you, if A has got a train standing at his red stop signal outside his signal box and he wants to send it down the line, he asks B is the line clear? If the line is clear B will respond and tell him so and then A can pull off his signal and the train will then progress through that block section until it gets to the signal at signal box B when it will stop again. If you want to know signal box codes and how that worked there is a video on the channel about it. Once the train gets to B he offers it to C. If C accepts it B can pull off his signal and the train will pass that uh, red signal outside signal box B 
and progress to single box C. That's quite simple. If it's an express train, that process happens fast enough that the train doesn't have to stop at every signal and wait for the signalman to ask the next signalman. The train chugs along the line and expects to see each of the red signals in the clear or off position so that it can proceed. Now it may well be, for one reason or another, that signalman B can't pull off his signal and let the train advance into the section between B and C and therefore he leaves his signal down in the on position. Our express comes roaring around the corner and suddenly sees a red stop signal. Well, express trains, even uh, in the old days, couldn't stop on a sixpence. They probably need half a mile or so to stop. And so it's a bit unfair to say, here's a stop signal, stop at it. So what happened is that we had the introduction of what we call distant signals. These are the yellow ones. These are the caution signals that tell you what the red signal further down the line is going to do. So the distant signal would be on, that is in the level position, and the driver would think, hang on a minute, the distant is on, therefore the red stop signal must be on, therefore I must slow down and be prepared to stop at the next red signal. That's what distance do. Now B actually controls two bits of line. It controls the section between A and B, but it also controls what would be normally referred to as station limits, that is the tracks over which it has direct control outside its signal box. So here's a situation where we have a train coming from A, it passes B's distant signal and then gets to B's home signal which is the end of the block section and now enters into B's station limits, that is it's going to pull up at the platform and stop. Now B's first home signal which is the one outside the signal box and the what is labelled here as the starter signal at the end of the platform represent station limits for signal box B. Incidentally once the train has passed the home signal outside signal box B and entered into the platform the section, the block section between A and B is empty and B can tell signal box A accordingly. The other thing to note is that if the train is going to run through the station, the distant signal at B can only be pulled off if both the home and the starter signal are pulled off, that is, they are clear. If either of those is in the stop position, the distant can't be pulled off. So the starter signal at the end of the platform really is the entrance then into the next section between B and C. Now I'm just going to concentrate on signalman B here and illustrate something which is much more akin to what we normally have on our layouts, that is some cross drivers and some sidings and all sorts of other stuff. So here's signal box B's diagram. He has a distant signal on the top line, then he has that home signal which represents the end of the block section between A and B, then he has a starter signal at the end of the platform as before. But now we've gained another signal beyond that called the advanced starter signal. Now in modern parlance this is called the section signal because it's the furthest forward of B's signals and it represents the signal that allows any train to go into the next section. That will be the section between B and C. But you can see that if you have a train that pulls up, a goods train let's say, pulls up and stops at the starter signal at the end of the platform, the engine wants to run round. It can't run forward of that starter signal unless it had permission to enter into the section between B and C. Well, that's nonsense. So what B now gains is an advanced starter, that is the outer end of his station limits is extended, allowing the shunting, uh, the train engine to run forward past the crossover and then shunt back over the crossover to get back onto the back of the train in order to shunt. And we also gained some ground signals represented here by these dots and the ground signals or shunting discs um, they allow trains to make moves from running lines onto shunting lines. So our freight train has pulled up at the platform at the starter signal which is showing as red and it wants to run around the train in order to shunt a wagon into that siding. So the signalman doesn't need to talk to signal box C because the train is now man manoeuvring within station limits. So he can pull off the home signal 
but he can't pull off the advanced starter because he doesn't have permission to have a train enter into the block section between B and C. So the engine can uncouple, run forward, but stop at the advanced starter. Now, the ground signal then is used for the engine to reverse. The ground signal shows that the points have been thrown and the engine reverses back over the crossover onto the other line all the way down to beyond the second crossover. It can then reverse back onto the rear of the train and the ground signal then allows it to reverse backwards into the siding and shunt a wagon into that little siding next to the signal box. Now incidentally the ground signal which is the one just outside the signal box B would be a double. The first one would at the top would show the shunt back into the siding and the second would be the shunt over the crossover. So the shunting engine runs, uh, puts his uh, wagon in the siding, goes back into the head shunt. The ground signal there in the siding allows him to run out of the siding back onto the running line. He runs back into the platform. He then uses the ground signals again to run round his train to get onto the right end, making sure he doesn't go past the advanced starter signal and running round and reconnects with the front of his train behind the starter signal and the starter signal can then be put back to danger. Now B can go through the process of talking to signal box C, asking permission for that train to continue and when that train does have permission to continue he can pull off the starter, he pulls off the advanced starter and the train proceeds into the block section between B and C and off onto signal box C. The other thing worth noting here is that whilst all this shunting is going on there is nothing to stop signal box B accepting a train into the block section between A and B although he would keep his home signal to the one on the left here at danger and of course the distance would be at danger so a train could pull up and stop at the home signal while something was shunting in station limits the thing that affects us as modelers here though is that between that home signal on the left and the crossover there must be a minimum what's called a clearance point which is normally a quarter of a mile. Now when you think that in double O scale a mile is about 60 odd feet you're talking about the home signal the entrance into station limits for, for B being about 15 feet away from that crossover and in fact beyond that you'd have the distance signal will be another 15 feet away there are very few of us who can spark our signals 15 feet apart so you can see we have a few modeling problems now one of the things we can do on our models is to ignore signals altogether and well you've got very small stations that can sit within block sections quite legitimately typically on very quiet lines you don't need signals the train is simply within that section and it's protected by the signals either end and Blowick Lane is one such example. The other advantage we have is something which actually many people see as a problem that is compression of the layout. We don't need 15 feet between a junction for argument's sake or a crossover and the home signal we can compress that down. You know, I've compressed it down to about five or six feet but it still looks okay. Here behind the wagon works at Yarslow I've ignored the advanced starter. It's going to be beyond this crossover so that the train can pull forward and then reverse back into the loop or into the uh, permanent way sidings but it's too far down the line to show so I don't bother. And of course we don't have passenger or freight safety to worry about it's a bit of a pain if we run one train into another or we run a train into a section where we don't have power but at the end of the day nobody dies it's a bit of fun so we haven't really got to worry about that aspect we also don't need to worry about interlocking our points with our signals now there are some layouts that do that and I certainly admire them that do but it's not something which is vital one last point before we leave this subject alone and that is that uh, sidings and points in sidings that don't affect running lines can be operated locally so in your engine shed or in your yard you can have a local lever operating the points. Where you've got a group of points that might 
be operated and may have some effect on a running line of some sort, then the signalman will have control. Now at Yarslow, at the permanent way sidings, the head shunt is technically the running loop beside platform 3. Now it's not a line that trains would normally run through, but it could be one that an engine might use for a run round. So what I've decided to do is for the permanent way sidings is to have a lever frame operating all the points and if you look very carefully at the layout you'll see that there is a rod that runs from the signal box to this ground frame that is to release the ground frame in order that the local shunter can pull the levers and change the points and obviously the signalman will only release that ground frame if the line is clear enabling the train to shunt over the section of line. So I said before that signalling was a bit of a nightmare and I've just spent 15 minutes giving you the very basics but hopefully you will now understand block sections and station limits being the two bits of track that are controlled by a signal box, the home signal which is giving him, uh, giving a train permission to enter into station limits, what the distance signal is telling the driver and then the use of starters and advanced starters and ground signals once you're inside station limits. I hope that will make sense. There's bound to be a million questions and I might have to revisit this and give you a bit more. But for now, I hope that's okay for you. I'll see you soon.